Hello and welcome to the Life Together podcast, where we share in meaningful conversation about living for Christ and loving one another. Thanks for joining today, and we hope you enjoy this episode. Well, hey everyone, I'm here today with Therese Tade. And Therese, since I've known you, uh, since I've been here at Lost River, you've been one of the friendliest and most encouraging people that I've met. I really do mean that. And I knew I know that you and Daryl do so much behind the scenes and have such a love for people. And so thank you for being here today and being willing to um, record this episode. And I guess just tell us what life is like right now for the Tades. Okay. Well, Daryl and I are empty nesters now, and we retired many years ago from our public jobs. And recently, Daryl has gone back to work. Um, He's an optometrist at Precision Eye Care, so he's working a couple of days a week to help out another doctor that was in need and needed him back for a little while. So he's doing that. And I'm taking care of my grandbaby and have one on the way. So life is very busy at the Tate house. Yeah. Well, well, lots of exciting stuff and that's, that's wonderful. And thank you again for doing this. And uh, our topic for today is true religion. Now, just from that one title or topic, I imagine that a lot of people might already know where the conversation is going, maybe what passage we're moving toward. But I want to start with this word religion. Um, The word religion seems to have a pretty negative connotation today. It carries with it the idea of maybe exclusion, hypocrisy, condescension, corruption, and perhaps a word or a phrase that we're hearing more and more frequently as of late is even religious trauma. And across the country, and I think even within the church, it seems more and more that people are referring to the phrase spiritual, but not religious. All right, I want to be spiritual, But the whole religion thing is just outdated at best, if not a threat to modern society and human flourishing. And that's kind of the connotation that it's taken on today. Religion just does not have a very positive view in our culture and maybe even within the church. And so I want to ask you, just as we get into this, um, first of all, why do you think that is? Why do you think religion has kind of taken on such a bad name recently? And then along with that, what do you think religion is really all about? Okay. Well, um, just here recently, I was at the gym, and I was uh, walking on the treadmill and talking with a lady um, that, that I do know, I've known for the past three years, and I had invited her to come to worship with me. And the first thing out of her mouth was, I don't agree with your religion. Mm. And so I stopped a minute and I asked her, I said, what can you explain what you mean by my religion? And she said, well, she said, you know, I think that where you go to church, let's see, we can't wear pants. Um, Let's see. We can't drink alcohol. We And she started listing a bunch of rules. Mm. And I said, well, I said, I tell you what. I said, let's start with a verse in the Bible. I said, let's, I'm going to start there. And I'm going to tell you what God's definition of religion is. And, and then I want you to know that I agree with everything and believe and have faith in what God has said. So I directed her to James 1 and in verse 27 that says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. 
And she looked at me and said, well, I've never heard of that. Mm. And so we began a discussion from there. And it went really well. And she just had a very wrong opinion about what religion was. Mm. And so it was a very good conversation. And and I've made a little progress with her. So that was just an experience that I had. Yeah. Well, I love that story also because... As most people at Lost River know right now, uh, evangelism has very much been on our minds, and I feel like especially on my mind as of late. And what a beautiful way of sharing God's truth, of sharing Jesus with other people. Because I think there are so many misconceptions about things like just basic definitions, Christianity, truth, religion, the church, and all those things come with sometimes a lot of baggage for people to unpack and uh, understand perhaps in a different way. And, um, but what a beautiful and simple approach of, of, uh, showing someone that, Hey, maybe this means something a little bit different than what you've been told. And this is what I believe. This is my experience as it's lived out of God's word. And it sounds like that did have such a profound impact on her. And I'm excited to hear about maybe where that story ends up. But I think it's also important to just be, you know, honest as well about why religion has taken on a bad name. And maybe it's because at times there has been a lot of hypocrisy. And at times there has been great condescension and looking down on people. And sometimes it has been very exclusive and pushed others outside. And I think it's important that we recognize that and validate that as people are bringing, as as people outside the church are bringing that to the church's attention and saying, yeah, that's wrong. Just like you were saying with your friend, like that, that's, that's wrong. That's not what it should be. Here's what it should look like. And that's just such a, a, a beautiful passage. Um, yeah. And, I think this is the CSB. It reads just slightly differently. James 1, 27, pure, or I think another translation says true, an undefiled religion before God the Father's is to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. And what I want to ask um, is just, I, I know when I asked you about recording this episode, that was a passage that immediately came to mind. You're like, I, w- I would love to talk about this. And so I'm curious about that. Tell me about why this verse has come to mean so much to you over the years. Um, yes. Well, my entire life, I have either been read the Bible um, or my parents read the Bible to me. And then when I was old enough, I started reading it. So I, my com- my whole entire 58 years have been surrounded by the truth in God's words. I've Mm. had them taught to me. It's been in front of me. And as you get older, sometimes situations will be presented to you and you realize at those times, wow, this is what it's all about. As as I had told you earlier, Mm. sometimes this is where the rubber meets the road. And the situation that I recently have been involved in, in in just like the last day or two, I had a um, old high school classmate that had moved away. I grew up in a a little town um, about 60 miles from here, Tompkinsville, Kentucky. My dad um, moved us there when I was a freshman in high school, and he preached um, there in Tompkinsville. And so, you know, I met a lot of people in high school, and this one particular girl, um, had been taken out of an ab- abusive situation. Um, her life began to turn around and she moved away. And so this was probably about 25 years later. She had texted me and asked me how some people in Tompkinsville were doing. And I, in turn, asked her how things were going in her life. And and she told me that she 
that everything was going well, that God has been taking care of her and blessing her and she had a good job. And I asked her where she was living and she said, well, she'd been living in her car for the last three years. Mm -hmm. So that just started a conversation. It was just, you know, a friend from the past reaching out, saying hello and asking a few questions. And then all of a sudden, It hit me. This verse really came to life in that. How can I how could I possibly help this girl? And so um, I'm I'm learning right now. I'm learning about this situation and I have been praying and reading and and it's been it's been um, very much a part of my heart right now. Yeah. And so I'm kind of just, I'm right in the middle of this verse trying to figure out what I need to do. Yeah. Well, it's 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 a beautiful passage, and it's always so powerful when a verse like that can come alive for us, and we start to experience what it's like to live that out. Um, as the Spirit works to change us and to move us out toward helping others. Um, And digging into that verse for just a second, um, we sometimes, I think, reduce the idea of religion to sort of just like rituals and rule-keeping. And that's kind of maybe a little bit the perception of that friend that you were mentioning earlier and I do want to talk about how that does in some way get factored in, but um, maybe we could think about it like this. I, I don't know how helpful this model will be, but as I was reading this passage, it it struck me this way, that in the old law, the religious system was carried about by the priesthood, Right, and they would make sacrifices, and they would con- conduct different ceremonies and things like that, uh, for the purpose of showing reverence to God, and as a means of revealing the nature of God to the people. Or maybe another way that we could think about it is, on one hand, it's about the the priesthood helping the people come to know God and about making God known to the people. It's kind of this like two-way thing that that they had the responsibility to do. And now it's as if James is saying the ultimate way that we come to know God and to make God known to others is by visiting orphans and widows in their distress. And of course, that doesn't mean that rituals and rule-keeping are not important or that they have no place at all. Of course they're important, right? Rituals, though we may not use that word all the time, but uh, acts of worship and rhythms of Bible reading and things like that, that is the way in which we are reshaped into the image of God, right? We become what we worship. And so through daily and weekly routines of of coming together in worship and in prayer and partaking of the Lord's Supper and Bible reading and all those kinds of things, that is the way that the Spirit transforms us to look more and more like Christ. And so that's important. And so is, in some sense, rule-keeping, right? And while the term rule-keeping is is too simplistic, he says uh, in James 22, but be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and is not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed for his doing." And so absolutely, um, it's important that w- that we don't completely do away with the idea of religion being about 
acts of worship and coming together and being a part of a community of faith and participating in those acts and carrying out, being doers of the word. But it's it's like it's in James' mind, it's it's incomplete if true religion never moves from beyond that, if it never extends out to acts of love toward the world around us. Um, and so true religion, James is a- affirming to us, is visiting the orphans and the widows in their distress. And of course, when we read that, James is not trying to give us a specific limited list of people to take care of, right? Um, In fancy words, James is not giving us a perimeter ethic, but a centering principle. And so I want to ask you about this. Um, What do you think it really means to visit orphans and widows in their distress? Sometimes that word visit, maybe we think, you know, does that mean I just pop by, you know, some local place for 10 minutes, say hello and, and leave? Or do I just punch in my debit card online, you know, drop my donation off and then I'm, I'm good. I can check that box off. Like what, what is, what does that really mean? And then beyond just orphans and widows, who do you think this verse is calling us to move toward in our community today? Well, um, one thing recently, um, I think it was in Lawrence's sermon on Sunday that talked about the first thing we have to do is make a friend, Mm. to make a friend in order to make a difference. Yeah. And God wants our heart. And in that, we have to reach beyond our comfort level. You know, we live in a society where where most of us are very comfortable. Yeah. And we have more than we would ever need. So your time, giving your time, that's that's something that's hard, you know, in our society. Mm-hmm. And I really do think that when people see that you are giving your time and your effort It might be that it's going to take up a day, a week, a month, a year. But if you concentrate on maybe just one person at a time and be a be a friend and reach out to them and see how you can truly help them, not just a 10 minute visit. It might be that you need to run to the grocery store and get some food for them and spend your money and then come back and not just drop it off, but sit for an hour or however long that person needs. But it's reaching beyond our comfort levels. Mm. Mm. That's a really good way of putting it. It's, It's reaching beyond our comfort levels. And when I think about this verse it kind of jogs my memory to a couple a couple instances. One that I remember is on the way to church one Sunday morning, um, my dad noticed someone was walking on the side of the road, and this looked like a gentleman who was probably in his 70s or, you know, perhaps he just had a very rough life and could have been much younger than that. I don't know. Um, but it looked as if it was not even easy for him to walk, but he was far from any kind of housing or anything like that. So my dad decided to pull over and he asked what he needed. And then he invited him to just get in the car with us. And so we had a big suburban. So I remember I crawled into the third row furthest, furthest back. And this gentleman uh, climbed in with us and went to church with us. And then we all went out to lunch together and um, we got back to the apartment. We, we we took him back to the apartment where he was staying and um, he asked for some things that my my dad was not willing to help him get, but my, my dad tried to consistently... Um, you know, reach out to him and make sure that his needs were met. And what's interesting about that is when we got to church that Sunday, it was, uh, I was in the third grade, I think. And so I got to Bible class and the story that we were studying that day was 
the Good Samaritan. And so it just it made that story very real for me. Um, and of course, you know, not that we found someone beat up on the side of the road exactly, but that idea of of, of stopping uh, and moving toward people and uh, allowing our hearts to be moved with compassion to actually make a difference in someone's life. And now nothing ever came of that story. Um, as far as, at least as far as I know, he didn't become a Christian. I, I don't think I even saw him after that, but was my dad still living out James 1 27? Absolutely. Right. And, and sometimes I, I feel like we get stuck thinking that the only positive thing that can come out of loving the stranger, the only positive thing that can come out of doing good for the people around us is if they become like us or if they become Christians. And that is just not true at all. There's so much good that can come by just having an open heart and, like you mentioned, an open schedule, uh, a flexible, uh, creating margin in your life to go out of your way to help the people who are in need, whoever that might be, not just orphans and widows, as is specifically mentioned in James, but beyond that, it's about those who are disenfranchised and hurting and broken and those people if we just if we just pray that god opens our eyes we'll begin to see that all around us and so it's stories like that that grip me and and resonate with me and then you mentioned also being a friend um i like you uh, do not enjoy uh talking about myself and I feel like this has n- nothing at all to do with me. If anything, I feel like it shows me not to be a very great person. Um, but I was on Camp Friends one summer, and we were in Jacksonville, Florida. And I somehow got separated from my Camp Friend group, didn't know where they were. I, I went to the bathroom. They walked away. I walked out of the restaurant, and they were, they were gone. We were in this big, you know, massive outdoor shopping center And I thought, there's no way I'm going to track them down. So I just decided that I would go to the store that was closest to where we parked, thinking at some point they got to come back to the car and I'll see them. Well, as I, as I was walking toward the car, I heard, uh, well, actually take it back. I was walking to the car and I sneezed and then I heard someone say, bless you. And I looked over and there was a homeless man sitting outside the store near where I was headed and I looked over and, and I, I don't think I even noticed him until he said that, but I turned over, I said, thank you. And I kept walking and that just began weighing really, really heavy on me. I just thought about like, I didn't even notice him before. I didn't even think about that. And, and then I just walked away after he, you know, was, was kind enough to, you know, say, bless you, noticing me, like, and so I decided, okay, I'm just going to go back and sit down with him and just ask about his story. And that was one of the most powerful memories that I, that I have, like just hearing, you know, sometimes we make assumptions about people who find themselves on the streets, right? They messed up. They didn't do something right. They made mistakes, and yeah, that's true enough. And the man that I talked to, Gary, he did, and he acknowledged that. And he talked about how the mistakes that he made, because of those mistakes, there's almost nothing that he can do to recover from that because of the way that the system is arranged, right? There are certain mistakes you can make that make it really, really difficult for you to get help, even if you want to. But he said while he was in prison, someone, uh, I don't think he even remembers who it was, but somehow, some way a a Bible was given to him. And he said, that's all he did for the time that he was there. He just read and read and read and read. 
And I, I wish I had time to just share more of his story, but I feel like I feel like I was learning from a world class theologian just because he cared so much and was so passionate about the word. And of course, you know, again, I was on camp friends. We were leaving. We were going to another camp. You know, there was not anything practical that I could do to really change his life. I tried to get him in touch with a community of believers that were was nearby. You know, but. But was something done? Did I, you know, again, this is this is nothing about me, but it's like, did I at least try to be a friend? And did that maybe mean something to him? I hope it did. But I know for sure it meant something to me. And I feel like I learned so much from that interaction. Um, and so I just, I, I, those, the story, like this is so real. This is so relevant. Yeah. And if we open our eyes, it's uh, it's all around us. Well, and to piggyback on your point, when I was talking with my friend, I've never in 30 years heard her ever complain about mm. her situation. She never has asked me one time for anything, not a penny. Mm. And she always refers to God, how he has been with her, and she taught me something. In fact, it it brought me it brought me to my knees at my house and it made me it made me think of maybe just how bad and broken I am mm-hmm. living in a you know rich society and and having every, everything that I need and even more. It just made me think or maybe rethink how I need to feel about others. Yeah, absolutely. It, and, and I would say the same thing about Gary. That was one thing I noticed. He did not once complain, He and he did not once ask for anything. I talked to him for probably about an hour or maybe longer as we just sat on the sidewalk, and he did not once ask for anything. Now, by the end... Um, I was so just convicted. I felt like I just had to do something. And so, um, uh, you know, I I understand some people, understandably so, have issues with just handing out money. And I I completely get that. There's, And I agree. I think there's better ways of trying to take care of those kinds of needs than just handing money over because it can, it can, again, it can be used for, for bad things. But anyway, yeah, it was just fascinating that not once did he mention that. And I too feel that conviction that you're mentioning. Like I grew up and I know this isn't everyone's story and I'm not we're not painting with a a, a broad brush here at Lost River because everybody has a different story. But for me growing up, I never once had to worry about a roof over my head or clothes or a bed. Um, There was one time where uh, the plant where my dad worked got shut down and there was about a two week or month period where there was some, some concerns and I felt that in my parents, I could sense that concern. But outside of that, that was never where that was never concerned. And, and throughout my life, and I think so many fall into this this same boat. Like, yeah, we're so taken care of. We have so much abundance, so many things at our fingertips, both in terms of material things and also time. And we end up filling all this time that we have with all these material blessings. And we forget that as was the call to Abraham we are blessed so that we will be a blessing. Yes. We're not just blessed. We're not meant to be uh, uh, swamps or reservoirs, but rivers through which the life and love of God can flow out to the world around us. Well, and that's the beauty of our, I feel like with our group at Lost River, yeah. is we really, we, we, come, we come to worship to be fed, to be fed from God's word. And from that 
bread that we are receiving, we then go out and try to help others and bring others to our group so that they can receive the word and the bread that is really the only thing that fills us up. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think we should also note that, like, what's the impetus for this? Why do we do this? Um, well, that's this is exactly what God in Christ, by the power of the Spirit, has done for us. And I think about um, the passage from 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 7, where it says, Now as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love for us, he says, excel also in this act of grace. I'm not saying this as a command. Rather, by means of the diligence of others, I'm testing the genuineness of your love. And I, I love that phrase. James talks about that as like, uh, you know, this faith without works is dead. Mm-hmm. Or he says, if you see your brother uh, hungry or needing clothes, don't just say, you know, go in peace, be warm, be filled, but actually do something. And he says, I'm testing the genuineness of your faith for, you know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ through, er, oh, though he was rich for your sake, he became poor so that by his poverty, you might become rich. And well, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, But yeah, so that by his poverty, you might become rich. This is exactly what God in Christ through the Spirit has done for us. And so that's why we do this for others. And it's we could look at that and and we should probably think about how crazy that is, that God would do that for us. And when we do that for others, other people are going to look at us as crazy Sometimes other Christians will look at us as crazy. Like, what are you doing pouring yourself out in this way? What are you doing? I want to be careful with how I say this, but this is the words of Paul. What are you doing making yourself poor so that they could become rich? And that I don't think just means financially, but you know, that might be how people respond. But again, the answer is, well, this is exactly what God has done for us. And, you know, we have both have said that we were raised, you know, from birth on in good Christian homes and were fed the word. And I have to be reminded of the parable of the the laborers that came to the vineyard later. Mm. It does. God doesn't care when we come. It doesn't matter if we came at birth or if we come at, you know, 81 years old in life. He is going to accept us just the same. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're all welcome. And I love that parable. And then also the parable of like the wedding banquet Mm -hmm. where he sends out his servants to go and invite people and the people that he would expect to come doesn't. But he goes to the highways and the byways. He goes to the street corners. He goes to the people who are on the side of the road and the highways and he brings them in. And he clothes them in the finest of clothes, and he sits down and shares a meal with them. And I know that that is, again, it's a parable, and the meaning is beyond just physical needs and physical circumstances. But that image is so, I think, powerfully connected to what James says in 1 and verse 27, Mm -hmm. right? This is pure and undefiled religion. Let's invite everybody to share around this table and be a blessing to others. Well, and we want, you know, my goal as I get older at this age is a little different than when I was in my 20s. As you progress, you know, I just long, I long to be with God Mm -hmm. and Jesus. I just have that longing more now than I ever have because I understand it a little bit more. And so there's passages in the Bible that direct me more to knowing who God is and what brings it all back for me as far as the James verse is um, in Jeremiah chapter 22, 
when God was, um, he was talking about the king of Judah, who was, it was Josiah's son, who was an evil king. And he had everything. He had everything. But God said in verse 16, he said, talking about Josiah, who was a good king, he defended the cause of the poor and needy. And so all went well. Is that not what it means to know me, declares the Lord? And that really means, uh, it just, it touches my heart very seriously. Is that not what it means to know me? I want to know God and I want to know who he is, what he wants from me. And when, when he says that when we are defending the cause of the poor, reaching out to anyone, anyone who has need, it doesn't just have to be a, the poor, the widows. It could be someone who is, um, struggling emotionally. Mm. It's someone that is in need and needs help. God has the heart to help those who are in need. And really and truly, that's all of us. We're all broken. We're just broken maybe to various degrees. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's so powerful. And some sometimes, um, you know, I, to go back to James 1 and verse 27, I, I think sometimes we think about those two parts that are mentioned about true religion. True religion is to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. And then he says to keep oneself unstained from the world. And sometimes we look at those as almost contradictory. Mm-hmm. That if I'm going to, if I'm going to, keep myself unstained from the world, then I have to cut myself off from the world. And so what would you say to someone who is on the one hand trying to move toward the hurting and the broken, whether it is physically or, as you said, emotionally, but on the other hand, that same person maybe feels worried about how to set the right boundaries and not be corrupted by those worldly influences. How do you think we balance that tension? Well, when we keep ourselves unspotted from the world, okay, in our world today, you know, I feel like that maybe just the simple, basic, you know, loving someone. And God has told us that there are no rules in loving. You know, keeping ourselves unspotted from the world. Yeah, God does want us to conduct ourselves like he has told us to. He wants us to be pure in spirit and and mind and you can you can still love. You can still love and be the person that God wants you to be. You can still step into um a situation that might not be might not have a godly atmosphere, but you can still be that light. Mm -hmm. You can still be a light in a godless atmosphere. Um, And and we just, we each have to think on our own, you know, what what does God expect from me? And, you know, we're just, we're just, we're called to be representatives of him but to still go out into the trenches to love and help others. Right. If I am just like the world around me, well, yeah, I, I, I might not be in a very good place to serve the people of the world because that means I probably have the very same needs that everybody else does. And not to say that we're not also always in need and uh, and broken, but... I guess the difference is we know the fix. We're in a relationship with the one who is transforming us and changing us. And we are in a community where we have found the sense of belonging. And while we do still have all these needs physically and emotionally and spiritually, we found the one who can provide all of those things. And when we move toward him 
instead of toward the world, then he positions us in such a way as to change the world around us. And so they're, again, they're not mutually exclusive. They, they go hand in hand. And it's simply, like you said, just about loving people. Mm-hmm. That's how we know God. And that's how we make God known to others. Yeah. And we can, you know, we can say we have faith in Jesus. I think sometimes we need to just question what is the genuineness of that faith? Is Mm. our faith truly genuine? And I think that when you have to answer that self, yourself for that, and that's going to just come in your daily walk and what you choose to do and how you choose to help others. Yeah, absolutely. It does absolutely come down to that daily walk. And that kind of leads, I guess, into the last thing that we'll talk about today. And that is just maybe someone's listening and they do feel very convicted by this. In fact, I feel very convicted by this right now. And and maybe also, maybe people feel a little bit overwhelmed as to how to practically and consistently follow, as you said, on a daily, weekly, yearly basis, the James 127 life. And so why don't we just end by talking about where you believe people can start as they try to live this out? Like, how do we take the first step toward this principle? Um, recently, I came in touch with um, a group here. It's it's to help uh, mothers who are contemplating abortion, and you can put your you can put your name on a list that they have, and the only job you have is they will text you and say we've had a mother walk through the door who's contemplating abortion. Will you please stop and pray right now? Hmm. They're doing the physical work. But you, it may seem like a very simple thing, but you can just do something, you know, as it's it's not small, but just stop and pray. You know, your name is on a list to get a text to stop and pray that that girl will change her mind and not have an abortion. And there are so many things like that out in our community that we can tap into as Christians. So it's out there. Sometimes we just need to do a little work. It might just be a phone call, you know, looking in in your phone in a directory and making a phone call to um, some place that reaches out to the community. And there may there's always something that you can do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just to mention one other thing that you that you brought up earlier, how It takes training our minds to look for that. Um, Sometimes it's taking a very specific action, like you mentioned, you know, calling different uh, uh, programs, organizations around the community and getting involved that way. But then also there is someone if if we set if we allowed ourselves just 5 to 10 minutes we could probably make a list of at least 2 to 5 people that are in need that are out even even that are outside of our community of faith outside of our church family and of course i believe it's galatians paul would say do good unto all especially the household of faith so mm-hmm. of course right Family first. You got to take care of your family. Um, you got to take care of that the household of faith, but don't forget to do good to all as well. And we could probably come up with a list within just five to ten minutes of people who are in need. Or maybe it takes one day at the office, one day at school, one day at the grocery store, one day walking around town or wherever we might be, to start recognizing 
oh, this person seems like they're in need. This person looks downcast or based on this conversation I had with this coworker, they've got a lot going on. And then we start to realize how we can plug into those needs, how how we can, I guess, plug them into the source, the one in whom all needs are met. And through our reaching out, through our friendship with them, Mm -hmm. we can help lead them or love them into a transforming relationship with Jesus. I agree wholeheartedly. (laughs) Well, Therese, thank you so much. Is there anything else that you'd like to add on before before we wrap up? Um, Just you've got you've got to keep yourself in the Word. You've got to read. It's not just reading a Bible with pages. You're reading the Creator of our universe's words that He has shared with us, and we we don't even realize what a gift we have with that to be able to get to know him with the words that he's given us it yeah. is transforming and i i want to share that with others so that they will have the same joy and peace that i have experienced yeah. by letting god into my life yeah, absolutely. As Lawrence says, right, I've, I've heard him say several times, keeping one eye on the word and one eye on the world. Yeah. And in, on one hand, you see the way things are mm-hmm. in the world compared to the way we see things could be and should be. And Christians are those who stand in that gap. We stand in the gap between the way things are and the way things could be and should be. And God uses us, the church, his people, through our own flaws and failures and messed up and brokenness and all those things, he still chooses to use us to bring his redemptive work to completion. And that, that's true religion. Yes, it is true religion. So, well, Therese, thanks so much for uh, doing this today. This was a lot of fun. I love just... Yeah, I love your insights and your passion for this. And I'm praying about those stories that you mentioned in your life. And again, just really appreciate it. Really am thankful for what you and Daryl do here at Lost River. Um, And thanks again for coming on today. Thank you, Daryl.